me with the joy of the God. I thank you for this opportunity to share to your next generation. Use me mightily, Father, as your vessel. Increase in me as I decrease, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Can anybody guess what we're going to talk about this month? Radical love. <laughs> Radical love. Why love? Why love in the month of February? It's the month of love. That's right. You know what else is in February? My birthday. My birthday. Thanks, guys. No, but for all, we celebrate. Um, February is the month of love. So all month long, we're going to talk about love. And mainly, it's called the month of love because which holiday is in February? Valentine's, Valentine's Day, right? And who doesn't love love? I love love. We all love love, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean loving someone. You can love food. You guys all love food? Do you guys love movies? Do you guys love certain cars, doing certain things? You can love all that kind of stuff, right? But I hope you also love the adult person in your life that's taking, that's taking care of you, your parents, your aunt, uncle, grandparents, that sort of thing. But during the month of February, we're going to be speaking more specifically on the radical love of God. Amen. So before we get into that, I have a, share, a story to share with you. So most of you all know that I grew up in the church. Um, my mom was Christian. She was Pentecostal. My dad was Catholic. Um, but he went to a local Christian church with my mom. And so every week we'd get up early and go to church. And once a month, we would actually go to our family church. And our family church was about, about an hour away. So we drive about an hour away to our family church. And at this family church is where I really witnessed church. So when I say that, I mean speaking in tongues. Everyone was praying in tongues. Um, healing with the laying of hands, people laid out on the floor receiving their miracles, church that went on for hours. And when I say hours, we could have been there for two, three hours for one service. So I grew up knowing who God was and how important God was in my life. But as I got older, I strayed away from who God was. I stopped going to church. Um, I would still pray at night, but I wasn't going as often as I had brought up to be. I would tell my mom, no, I'm too tired, I'm gonna sleep in. And because she wasn't a forceful mom, she didn't drag me to church with her. Because of that, because of my straying, um, I started hanging out with the wrong people. Well, not really the wrong people, but people that didn't have um, a good influence in my life. And I ended up with someone that, and I started having sex with this person in high school. Through that, I ended up getting pregnant. I got pregnant in high school. I felt so unworthy of myself because of that. I felt like I let everybody down. I let my parents down. I let my family down. I let my God down. The God that I had grown up with, the God that I had known values and morals um, from, I knew I let him down from not only getting pregnant in high school, but I also chose to have an abortion in high school. And you can feel how, you can imagine how heavy that was as a high school student, um, not being able to face myself, not being able to face my family, not being able to face my friends, knowing the choice that I made, getting pregnant, having an abortion, knowing that I had a relationship with God and I still went and did these things. Because of that, I felt that I, I wasn't worthy I wasn't worthy of his love. I wasn't worthy of anyone's love. And growing up, especially in high school, you want to feel loved. You want to feel like you're accepted. You want to be able to feel that you belong. Amen. Which brings me to point number one. Everyone needs love. So if you want to write that down in your notes, number one, everyone needs love. And we're gonna pull up a diagram. It's a, it looks like a pyramid. And this diagram is called the, Ma the Maslow diagram. I don't know if some of you have taken psychology or have seen this online. This is the Maslow diagram. And the diagram is a hierarchy of needs according to a psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow. 
And he uses this diagram to explain that people are motivated by five basic needs. So the first need is actually starts at the bottom, the foundation, physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem needs, and then self-actualization. So just to explain what this means, physiological needs are basic physical needs. So um, like eating, drinking, um, staying warm, that sort of thing. So Maslow considered physiological needs to be the most essential of your needs. Why? Because if those needs aren't met, you can't do anything else. So for example, if um, you had work to do, but if you were hungry, all you would focus on was your hunger. Mm -hmm. If you had things to do, like you had errands to run, but you didn't sleep, all you would focus on is, I am so tired to get through the day. So those needs needed to be met in order for you to continue on to, um, to do other things. The next need is a safe environment. And this includes um, things that make you want to feel safe. So your home, your safety net, being around, um, feeling secure in your environment, feeling protected around people that are around you. The next level is the need to feel um, loved or belonging. And loving and belonging needs include being connected to others, having um, friendships, belonging to a group, um, meeting people, People meet these needs through friendships, relationships, or just feeling accepted by your peers. Then it's the esteem level. Esteem is admiration and respect. But more specifically, you guys would know this as self-esteem, right? And the respect and desire from others. So self-esteem -inclu self includes um, when you need to feel value, when you need to feel worthy, when you need to feel like you're respected. And then at the very top of the diagram is called self-actualization. And this is the highest form, um, and it involves a person really knowing themselves, knowing what they want, what they like, understanding themselves, reaching their full potential. And at this level is when they continue to grow. However, self-actualization is different for everybody. So what I feel worthy, how I feel I'm growing can be different from what my husband feels. More recently, researchers have assessed and um, have researched more about the motivation of needs for people. And they've come, to this, they've come to the conclusion that love and belonging is a really important human need. Through love and belonging, people have positive emotions. When you feel that you're loved, when you feel that you belong, you're um, your energy is up, your positivity is up, you don't, have as, you don't have as many negative thoughts. When you feel like you don't belong or that you're not loved, all these negative thoughts start creeping into your mind. So through the years after Maslow, they decided, they've, they've come to the conclusion and research that love is really important. Love is a huge important need in the human, um, in the human, in the human's well-being to feel acceptance to be motivated, to move forward, to have positive thoughts, to think highly of themselves and not think that they're, not, that they're undeserving. So I mentioned the need of love and belonging. So just to be clear, this is a different type of love from um, saying that I love that movie, or I love food, or I love sleeping in. It's a more desirable type of feeling. So by show of hands, how many of you have um, dogs. Amen. So, when when you get home, when you get home, do your dog do your dogs greet you at the door with their tail wagging and they're so excited to see you, right? Or or when you're just watching TV and laying down, are your dogs just like laying down next to you, cuddling with you, and you feel that connection with your animal, with your dog, right? You feel that love. That's the type of connection. That's the type of love that we're going to be. Um, really talking about the need to feel loved by someone and to be able to love someone. More importantly, it's, it's that feeling that you both share. Amen. Love is a need. And who better to know what love is than God himself? Which brings me to point number two. So if you're taking notes, number two is God is love and his love is unconditional. 
we can go to 1 Corinthians 13. So 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love scripture. Why? Because it depicts everything that love is. So love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is God's description of love. Why? Because God is love. This is what God is like. This is his, char this is his character. Love is his character. Love is in him, so he uh, what's it, projects it out, amen. His love is perfect. And he is everything listed in this scripture. So if we were to replace the word love with God, God is patient. And if you don't believe me, you can find that in 2 Peter. God is kind. You find that in Isaiah. God does not envy. You'll find that in Galatians. God does not boast. God keeps no records of wrongs. When I was growing up, I heavily relied on that part of the scripture. God keeps no records of wrongs. And God never fails. You'll find that in Psalms. The best thing about the love of God is that it's unconditional. And what does that mean? God loves you with no strings attached. You don't have to do anything to expect his love in return. Most other types of love come with a condition. I'll love you if you do this. I'll love you if you treat me this way. I love you, but there's always that condition, especially with us as humans. When we love somebody, we kind of expect it to be returned at a price with something attached, right? Oh, I don't love that guy anymore because he doesn't treat me right. Oh, I don't love her anymore because she doesn't call me. My parents don't love me because they didn't buy me what I want. Those are conditional types of love. And in the Bible, there's other types of love as well. There's eros, an eros type of love, storge, philia, and agape. So just to explain what those types of love are, eros is a love that you feel between somebody. It's a romantic type of love. So the love that I have with James, that's an eros type of love. Storge, storge is a type of love between of your family. So how I feel towards my kids. I have a storge type of love for them. Philia is a type of love that you have for your brothers, your sisters in Christ, or your friends. So this, the feeling that I have towards my coaches would be a philia type of love, amen. The type of love that God has for us is called agape. You can only experience this type of love if you go closer to God. Why, because it comes with no strings attached to understand that he loves you for you and you alone. And to realize that you love him just because he is God. He doesn't have to do anything for you. So an agape love is a love that's reciprocated without anything expected in return. I love God because he's good. I love God because he's God. I love God because he is the creator. I love God, I love God. That's it, period. And the same goes for how he loves you. God loves you because you're his child. God loves you because he created you. God loves you because you're you, no strings attached. So let me say this again. He first loved us. In fact, in Romans 5, 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. God loves you unconditionally. Saint or sinner, God loves you. God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Not the sins of Jesus, but for our sins. Why? Because he wanted to have a relationship with us. Because he loves us that much. Because he loves you that much. For the things that we did, Jesus died on the cross. If this isn't love with no strings attached, then I don't know what is. It's an I love you no matter what kind of love, and he means it. 
I love you no matter what. I love you no matter if you lie to me. I love you no matter if you, uh, do you know in the Bible that God loves murderers? That God loved thieves? That God loved those who were um, sexually sinful? So is that alone, do you feel that you had to be perfect to receive God's love? I know God loves me despite of the fact of things I did when I was growing up. Which brings me to point number three. God loves you. Period. God loves you. Let's read Romans 8, 35. And it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Move on to 37. <clears throat> no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that means through your hardships, you've already conquered it because God loves you. Through your hard times, you've already conquered it because God loves you. Through when you feel persecution, you've already conquered it because God loves you. Go on to verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing you do can make God from stopping from loving you. Nothing in this world can make God from, from stopping to love you. Nothing. Nothing. Get that in your head. There is nothing I can do that would make my God stop loving me. God, I don't love you anymore. It's okay, I still love you. God, I want nothing to do with you. It's okay, I still love you. God, I backstabbed my friends. It's okay, I still love you. Why? Why, why are those things so important to know? Because he can correct it. No matter what you did, because he loves you, he can correct all of your wrongs. You might not see it at first. You might not feel it at first. But know that God loves you. Growing up in the church, I knew God loved me. But I didn't understand the type of love that God had for me. I didn't understand it until years later when I had my abortion. And it took me some time to pick myself up for people around me, my mentors, um, to speak life into me, to remind you, to remind me as I'm reminding you that God loved me despite of the choices I made despite of the choices that I continue to make, present tense, God still loves me. The same God that created the heavens and the earth loves you. He loves everything about you. Nothing you do can make God stop loving you. Even during the times that you feel furthest from him, he still loves you. You can feel like the world is falling apart. You can feel like you're so disconnected from anything, anyone, anybody, and God still loves you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, and I cannot repeat that as much. I cannot repeat that. Oh, I forgot that saying. I cannot repeat that enough. Nothing you do can separate you from the love of God. And what's great about it is you don't have to do anything for him to love you. Yeah. He loves you because of you. You make mistakes. If you didn't make mistakes, he loves you. If you got in trouble, if you didn't get in trouble, he loves you. You do things that you regret or don't regret, you wish you did, you wish you didn't do, guess what? God still loves you. <clears throat> Allow God's love to fill you. Allow God's love to heal you. Allow God's love to free you from the things in the past that you do regret, from the things in the past that you feel are holding you back, from the things in the past that you feel like you can't forgive yourself for, allow God's love to, feel, to fill you, to free you from all of that. That's good. When I felt unworthy because of the mistakes I made, I, I stepped away from my relationship with God, and I felt like I let everybody down. I felt like I couldn't, um, face anyone. I felt like 
I just disappointed everyone because of the choices I made. And because of that, I felt like, well, I knew I messed up. Because of how I was brought up, I knew right from wrong. But did I pay attention to it? No. I fully went head on, knowing the choices I made were not supposed to be the things that I was doing. But God was always there for me. His unconditional love was there for me and is there for me still. And his unconditional love is there for you as well. So I want you to just take a moment and just think about God's love. Think about God's love for you. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to be loved by God? What does it mean to know of God's love? And if you haven't experienced God's love, I pray for you. I pray that you get that touch of love from God, that you know that you can just stand there with your eyes closed, just thinking about the things you did, and you just feel that warmth take over you, knowing that that's God's love all over you. But what does his love mean to you? Does it mean knowing that you're never going to be alone? Does it mean knowing that he loves you, that because he loves you, you can do anything? I know that's me. Does it mean knowing that he loves you, you're forgiven? Me again. And as you're thinking these things, and as just the music softly plays in the background, um, I'm just gonna have the coaches pass out some hearts. Some on the bluff. As they're passing out these hearts, um, I just want you to think about what does God's love mean to you? And if we can have the First Corinthians um, scripture in the background, please. So as the hearts are getting passed out, what I want you to do is just think about what does God's love mean? Does it mean I'm forgiven? Does it mean that God loves me because God loves me? And I just want you to, to think about what it means to you and then to write it down write down what god's love means to you on that heart Love me to you. 